Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for Desnede, Mississippi, Churchill River. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to support the wet student people tonight. Over the past weeks, news organizations from coast to coast have mobilized to every blockade and every protest, vying for sound bites and clips to share on the morning news and on their social media. Who has been forgotten in all of this? It seems to me, Madam Speaker, it is the people of Wet'suwet'en Nation. Madam Speaker, politicians across Canada and this House have taken it upon themselves to speak on behalf of the people. I do not want to even pretend to speak on behalf of these people because I think that would be foolish for me to claim to do so. It would lack credibility and integrity. Madam Speaker, let me be clear, however. We're at a very important point in our history, and I intend to be on the side of the Wet'suwet'en people tonight who have the right to self-determination and to control their own destiny. The elected leadership of all 21st Nations whose territory runs along the pathway of the coastal gas link, eight hereditary chiefs, and over 80% of the people are in favour of getting this pipeline built. Madam Speaker, as Mayor of the City of Meadow Lake for eight years, I know just how difficult it is to get 80% support for a project. That's nearly impossible. That is why I appreciate the hard work that the elected chiefs have put in to negotiate an extremely successful deal with Coastal LNG on behalf of their people. Madam Speaker, there's over $1 billion in commitments to Indigenous workers and to Indigenous-owned firms because of this project. These dollars could be used for important investments in these communities like housing, mental health, education, recreation, and many other things. Madam Speaker, it's not just about the dollars, however, being invested in these communities. It's about the creation of well-paid, sustainable jobs. Madam Speaker, I represent a riding that is a population that is over 70% Indigenous. During the election campaign and in the months since, I have had many opportunities to talk to people about my vision for Northern Saskatchewan, to talk to people about the opportunity to have well-paying, sustainable jobs. It's a very similar theme to what we talk about tonight when we consider this project. The benefits that I have spoken about over and over again are threefold. First, there's an obvious economic benefit that comes with having a good job and being able to take care of yourself and your family. Secondly, there's an innate, an innate need in each of us to be fulfilled, to feel valued, to have a sense of self-worth. There's nothing greater than feeling that one experiences after coming home having put in an honest day's work. Madam Speaker, the most important benefit that I've been talking about over the last several months is the hope that comes from the opportunity of having a good job. Youth suicide in northern remote communities is very real and it is a heartbreaking crisis. I have spoken many times about how the suicide crisis in northern Saskatchewan is due to a lack of hope. When young people can look up to those they respect and admire, like their parents, their uncles, their brothers and sisters, maybe their older cousins, and to see them succeed by being part of the industry in northern Saskatchewan, they have hope. They have hope for a better future, and they no longer have to consider suicide. Madam Speaker, I realized that a good job does not solve every problem, but it is sure a good start, and it goes a long way. So the question becomes, how do we create these jobs? I have spoken consistently about creating partnerships between Indigenous communities and private industry. These partnerships create opportunity for people in remote northern communities to fully participate in the economic well-being of Canada as a whole. This project is a perfect example of that model at work. Madam Speaker, we cannot simply allow a minority of protesters to stand in the way of the will of the wet sweat and nation. These protesters have taken extraordinary measures to hold Canada hostage, compromising the safety of our rail infrastructure, blocking and intimidating people attempting to go to work, and in some cases, physically assaulting elected members of a provincial legislature. These blockades have had real effects on my constituents. I have heard from farmers in my riding that many are being told they won't be able to deliver the grain they have contracted for February and March. Canada's reputation as a stable supplier is at risk. Our farmers are risking losing their global customers and they will find other suppliers. Madam Speaker, these are people's livelihoods we're talking about. It's how they feel, feed their families. It's what heats their homes. The blockades have to end. 
If we allow a small minority to succeed in blocking this project, I, I am concerned that it will be impossible for future projects to ever see the light of day. Canada's courts have been very clear. The standard for meeting the fiduciary duties for consultation and accommodation are very high. These thresholds have been met by the coastal LNG project and they ought to be respected. My colleague referenced Ellis Ross already in her, in her speech a few moments ago, but I want to do it the same. Ellis Ross is the BC MLA for skiing and a former councillor and subsequent chief councillor for the Heisla First Nation. He, for, he served in that role for 14 years and he had this to say recently. The heated debate over who holds authority of territories of First Nations, be it hereditary chiefs or elected band leaders, may serve the interests of those seeking to disrupt construction of the coastal gasoline pipeline, but it does absolutely nothing for the well-being of an average Aboriginal living on a reserve. He goes on further to say, allowing outsiders to undermine and dismiss years of careful consideration and consultation with elected chiefs who want nothing more than to secure a brighter future for their membership is quite unacceptable. Madam Speaker, I am not naive enough to not realize that there are members of the Wet'suwet'en Nation who are not in favour of this pipeline. Of note, four of the 12 hereditary chiefs, as well as approximately 15% of the people, would fit in that category. I will always support the rights of those not in favour to protest peacefully. But as with any major decision, Indigenous or non-Indigenous, total consensus is often unachievable. That is why authentic relationships must be developed so we can have difficult conversations when the need arises. Madam Speaker, let me share a little bit from my own personal experience and journey on this. As I said earlier, 70% of my riding is Indigenous. We grew up going to school together, playing sports together, and in general, living shoulder to shoulder. Later in life, when I became the Mayor, I had the privilege of working with and developing strong relationships with four chiefs from Flying Dust First Nation, who was my neighbour at the time, and who served with me when I was the Mayor. We shared the challenges of water supply, policing, development activities, recreation, and many other matters. It is my sincere belief that we were able to navigate these challenges because we invested in positive and authentic relationships prior to the issues being put on our table. I truly appreciate the effort that the Minister of Indigenous Services has made recently to have dialogue. But unfortunately, the Prime Minister has left him in the unenviable position of having to deal with this in a reactive manner rather than in the proactive manner that it deserved. It is clear that these attempts have to have dialogue suddenly in the wake of a crisis are too little and far too late. This government seems to be focused on blaming the Harper government for all of its failures, but Madam Speaker, they've had four and a half years and all we hear is virtue signaling and lip service. In my riding during the campaign, I consistently heard the term empty promises and unfulfilled commitments from my Indigenous friends. That's been made abundantly clear over the past few weeks with the choices this Prime Minister has made to prioritize a seat on the UN Security Council instead of dealing with the crisis here in Canada. Madam Speaker, that's not leadership. And right now, leadership is what this country needs. We are asking for a common sense approach to this crisis, respect the rule of law, open authentic dialogue on reconciliation, and do not allow the minority to overrule the majority. Madam Speaker, as former Mayor of Meadow Lake, I know how important these development projects are for, for Indigenous communities. It is real and tangible path to economic freedom, self-government and true reconciliation. That is why I'm standing today in solidarity with the elected councillors, the hereditary chiefs and the people of the First Nation. The Prime Minister said in the House today, patients may be in short supply. It seems that the commitment to reconciliation is also in short supply. The Prime Minister did say something I agree with, however that we all have a stake in this. We need to find a solution and we need to find it very soon. I would only add that we should have started looking for a solution sooner. Today in the National Post, Derek Burney wrote that a minority government should not mean that we have no government. In the spirit of collaboration then, I encourage everyone, take a deep breath, refocus our efforts, shut out the radical minority and take earnest steps towards authentic reconciliation. Thank you, Madam Speaker.
questions and comments, questions et commentaires. The honourable member of New Westminster, Burnaby. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. I thank the member for his uh, comments. I know his writing very well, the Snethy Mississippi uh, Churchill River, because, of course, I've travelled from La Range to La Loche to Meadow Lake. Uh, and uh, I'd like to pay tribute to Georgina Jolibois, who is an extraordinary member of Parliament and uh, brought me in a number of times to work with people with disabilities throughout, uh, throughout the riding. So I know the riding very well. And he said at the outset of his speech, he didn't uh, expect to speak for the Wet'suwet'en, but then he attempted to do just that and denounced uh, what he calls a minority. Now, he understands, or should understand, of course, that consultation means uh, allowing a process to involve everybody in a community. And as we've heard very eloquently from the member from Skeena Bulkley Valley, uh, at the outset of uh, this emergency debate this evening, uh, a man who represents that riding, uh, he said very eloquently that uh, within the community itself, uh, there needs to be space so that the community uh, can make its decisions in its own way. So my question to him is, is very simple. He seems to be denouncing uh, a, a process that should take place and should respect everybody. And I would ask him, to consider that perhaps in saying that, what he is doing is, uh, in, a, in a sense, uh, being derogatory towards an entire community. Will he accept the... I'm sorry, I do have to pose the question so I can allow another question. I, the, the member had a, a minute and a half, and it should be about a minute. So, the Honourable Member for uh, Desnede, Missinippi, Churchill River. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to my colleague for the question. I appreciate you visiting my riding and knowing, noting it uh, with familiarity. Um, I think if you, if you look back at my comments in my speech, what I said very clearly is that Canada's courts have been very clear about the standard of fiduciary duty for consultation and accommodation, and that they, they are they're extremely high, and this process has gone on for greater than five years. Um, I also commented that as a mayor, um, one can never expect to get 100% consensus on a, on a decision, and, and, and ultimately that is the, the value of a, a democratic institution, and, and I, I suspect those of us in this House should actually appreciate the value of the democratic institution more than anyone. Um, I do also understand that, that in, the, in the hereditary nations and the clan system that, that maybe they don't use the same system of democracy we, we do, but there has been due course, the bar has been set very high, and that bar has, has been passed over and over on this project. Jens and comments. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Transport. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'd like to thank the Honourable Member for his, uh, his speech. Um, the Leader of the Opposition has called on uh, the Prime Minister to order the RCMP to act. Um, I know the Honourable Member mentioned the rule of law in his speech. Isn't this, um, the Leader of the Opposition, isn't his called for an illegal order, a direct violation of the rule of law? And will the Honourable Member stand up, condemn his leader, and uh, support the rule of law? The our Member for Desnede, Missinippi, Churchill River. I think um, the, the Member for his question. Um, I, I think you've heard so many comments today, um, people referring to the rule of law. But uh, to the Honourable Member, I'd say to, to the farmers in my riding, to the people that rely on the railway, to the people that rely on the ports um, for their livelihood, to feed their families, to look after their children and maybe their aging parents, I would say to you that, that um, the number I heard, and, and I'm going to honestly say I can't back this up with fact, but the number in the media for the agriculture industry is over $10 million of lost revenue in the ag industry already. Um, for every day that the rail system is not running, I read today, it's going to take four days to catch up for every day that it doesn't run. To the economy of Canada, getting these things back running, actually dealing with illegal blockades and illegal prote protesters is paramount at this time. Resuming debate, 